yesterday afternoon. Denver is so different. Colorado is so different than the South, and I, I do like the South. I don't know. I don't know what it is, but you guys are cool, all right? In Denver, we all think you're cool. When people hear I'm coming here. Now, sometimes I have to wonder, though, if I'm invited here because you want me to bring free marijuana. And that didn't happen today. <laughs> so just get it off your mind. We're, there's the marijuana joke right out of the front gates. We won't go there again. But I'm here today to talk to you a little bit about company culture and leadership and how those two things tie together. And I don't want to do the soft, squishy, oh, leadership. You know, I don't do soft, squishy, okay? I, I want to talk to you about real life stuff that you can bring to your companies or to your organizations, or to your nonprofits, or to your families, or to your sporting teams, whatever it needs, as far as that idea of how do we get better as it relates to leadership. And so the, the quick history on me, and, and some of that was in the introduction there, my dad started a property management company in 1978, Grace Management. So I grew up in the company doing everything a kid should not do. I was pulling those weeds, I was painting those doors and mowing lawns, everything you can think of, but it gave me a unique insight into the business because I was in the business. I was the first employee. I was free child labor to my dad. He loved that. So we, we grew slowly and steadily. I worked there in the summers in high school and, and I went to Colorado State University. I studied finance and real estate. I moved to Cheyenne, Wyoming of all places. Has anybody been to Cheyenne, Wyoming? Yeah, it's not the end of the world, but you can see it. You see it from Cheyenne. And I was, I was working in Cheyenne, hating what I was doing. My dad called me one day and said, I need to hire a property manager. The job's yours if you want it. So I jumped at that opportunity. That was about 20 years ago. At that point in time, there were, I think, three of us in the office, and we had about 100 doors that we managed. Uh, so today, we've got about 700 doors, roughly. Uh, we do residential, we do commercial, we buy, we sell, we invest ourselves, we flip. Uh, we follow the opportunity. That's kind of our mantra. If there's a real estate opportunity, we want to look at that opportunity. So I live in the Fort Collins, Loveland area. Uh, these are two of my kids. I've got four kids, and my kids love go to work with Dad Day, because you know, it's fun, right? So this is a picture of two of my kids, my two youngest, on Go to Work with Dad Day. Now, I'm in the real estate property management world, guys. So when it's Go to Work with Dad Day, and I have a picture of two of my kids standing in front of a house with a piece of paper taped on the door, who can guess what that is? <laughs> yeah, if you set eviction notice, you're right, yeah. yeah. Yeah, you're shaking your head. She's saying, Mark, you're sick. That is sick and wrong, and it is. It is sick and wrong, but that's the world I live in, guys, okay? Start them off young, all right? Start them off young. We say, hey, you're not a Cunningham man until you've kicked someone out of a house. That's what we say in our family. So that's kind of the screwy world that I grow up in. I know, I know, half of you are ready to leave now. You're like, this guy's crazy, but it's one of the, you see, property managers laugh at that. I talk to realtor groups and sometimes I say that and their mouths just drop open. They're like, that, that, is, that is weird, that is weird. So as it relates to leadership, here's what I want you to know. Who are my company, my company owners, my company leaders? Who has somebody that reports to you or you're in charge of in your organization? Anybody? Okay, fair number. The rest of you don't right now, right? But stay with me, stay with me. Leaders, here's what I want you to buy into for the next hour. You've got to buy into the statement. What happens in your organization is your fault and is to your credit. The good things going on in your organization, good job. The people that get along, great. That's you put something in place in that organization to make that happen. But the fact that your accounting is a mess, the fact that your rent collections are a mess, who's that on? That's on us, that's on the leaders, that's on whoever's in charge of that. Now, a lot of us are saying, yeah, but Mark, that, that's great, but I'm not the boss, I'm just an employee. Or, Mark, my organization, it's just me, or it's just me, one other person. Don't fall asleep, guys, because the things we're gonna be talking about today apply to everybody regardless of your position in the organization. If you're a one man, a one woman shop right now, these are the things you may need to know to help you take that organization to some other place in the future. So you don't know what's in store for you in the future. You just don't know. When I came on with Grace Management and it was me and my dad and a part-time secretary, ah, oh, I wish I would have known this stuff. Because we stumbled our way through this stuff to figure out how to lead a team of, of quite a few people. And, and leadership, there's such a hunger for that, isn't there? I'm, I uh, just finished off a three-year stint as uh, the chairman of the board for a, a fairly large church in the northern Colorado area. You want to talk dysfunction? Let's talk about a group of Christians and a church trying to lead the silly thing. My <laughs> word, a mess, right? But th there, there's that, that hunger for it because people don't get it right. So we're going to talk about that. And the assumption is this for the next hour. I know your motives are pure, right? We're not going to do the fluffy, hey, try to do good. We all mean well. Of course we all mean well. What we want to do is we want to push beyond that stuff to behaviors. What, what do I do Monday morning at my office if I want to have a better culture, if I want to improve my organization, if I want to be 
a better leader, whether that's on my sports team, at my church, in my family, or in my business. So here's what I believe. I came to my office the other day, parked my car. We've got, it's a pretty big parking lot as far as where I park to have to walk into our building. So I parked my car, walked into my, my office building, got in, my office is kind of in the back of the building, got in there, I sat down, and I realized I left my cell phone back in the car. Now, if that happened to any of you, what would you do? You go get it. I mean, it's not even a thought, is it? Well, of course I'd go get it. I can't function in my day without my cell phone, or women, ladies, your purse, right? Well, in the same way that you have to bring your cell phone, your purse with you into the office, I believe it, within that leadership role, you need to bring three things into your office, into your group, every single day. Just three things. Number one is energy. And by energy, we mean, we mean these types of things. I mean excitement, passion, inspiration. You must, must inspire the people around you, whether you're a leader or not. Engaging in these behaviors is what makes you a leader. You don't become a leader and then have to lead. You become a leader because you have leadership traits. And one of the things leaders do is they inspire the people around them. Nobody is self-inspired. Right? That idea of, gosh, I just want to hire a, uh, I, I do some coaching and what a person I'm coaching said, Mark, I just, I want to find someone to hire who's self-motivated. Guys, there's no such thing as a self-motivated person. All, all a self-motivated person means is they don't get their motivation from you. That's all it means. Because we all get motivation from someplace, don't we? It just means, oh, well, they're not self-motivated. No, they just don't get inspired by you. They've got to find that somewhere, and you've got to attract these types of people. You've got to bring this stuff in some way, and we'll talk about how to do that specifically, shape or form. Now, after you have energy, the second thing you need is clarity, because a, a room full of energy is not a good thing. I coach two of my kids, three of my kids' basketball teams right now. One of them is second grade girls. They've got more energy than you can imagine, right? That's not a healthy organization. Second thing we want to bring is clarity to our organizations, to our groups, to our teams. And by clarity, we're looking at, at this type of stuff, clarity of everything. If I walked into your office right now, if you have a team member back at your office, and I said to them, let me ask you a question. How is it, Randy? Yes. Randy, how is it that what you do helps contribute to the overall success of the organization? Because it does. Because it does, <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm not gonna argue with Randy, he's a scary looking man. But we have to answer that question, don't we? Everybody has to know in your organization, on your team, how what they do contributes to winning, what their responsibilities are. That clarity is missing. There was a, a survey done not too long ago I read about, and they, they interviewed, I don't know what it was, 10,000 uh, employees of companies of all sizes and shapes and forms, and they asked them all sorts of questions to list what made them feel engaged in the workplace. And it was like a laundry list of 100 things, you know, more money, better working environment, opportunities for advancement, you know, rank them. And the number one highest rated comment by the employees said this, this is what makes them feel engaged. I know what is expected of me in the workplace. Is that interesting? They want to know what you expect of them. So we have to have that clarity. Now, after we have that, number three is accountability. Now, now energy we can like. Clarity we can like, accountability, we, we kind of bristle at that, right? Ooh, accountability, yeah, really? I, don't, I don't want to be accountable. For the purpose of this conversation, we're defining accountability as simply measuring and reporting on performance. We've got to do that in our organizations, guys. We've got to measure our performance. We've got to report on our performance. My, my nephew plays on a, I'm kind of a basketball junkie. My nephew plays on a basketball team. He's in second grade as well, but guess what? In his league, they don't keep score. I hate when they don't keep score. We need to keep score. And that's fine for second graders. I get it, I get it. But guys, we gotta keep score. We need to start measuring and reporting on the performance of ourselves, of our organizations, of our businesses, or else we lose. So these are the things we're gonna talk about. So what I wanna do now is just kinda take a half step backwards, and I'm gonna walk through some of the things just to share some very specific things we've done in our organization as it relates to trying to bring energy, to trying to bring clarity, to trying to bring accountability. Fair enough? Okay, who's she? Flo Joe. Flo Joe. Yeah, anybody over under 30 is right. What? I don't know. Is she in the Olympics right now? Jackie Joyner Kersey, right? Performed in the 1988 Olympics. And there's a great story with her, and her husband was her coach. She came home with a handful of medals, and she ran the 200 meter. And she was training before the Olympics and having a bad training day. Her 200 pace was off. And her coach, her husband, calls her over and says, Jackie, stop trying to run fast. 
Instead, focus on the things that make you fast. I thought, that, that's pretty good, isn't it? Because so many of us try to have a successful organization. We try to make more money. We try to be successful. When we take a step back and we get our focus off of that and we focus on the things that make us successful, that make us have a stronger culture that attracts people to our organization, that's where you win. That's what comes through. So what, what I want us to do for the course of today is not focus on being better, not focus on doing the stuff that we think is going to get us there, but let's look at the actual behaviors we need to do to take us to that next level. Isn't that a good analogy with the Olympics going on right now? You guys are just looking at me blank faced. All right? I thought that was pretty good. So let's talk about energy. How do you bring, you know, how do you do that? How do you bring energy to your, your organization? And whether your organization's one person or 20 people or 500 people, it does not matter. You still have to bring this. And if it's just you, it's even more important and it's even more hard because now you are your boss. But there's two ways you do it, I think. And the first is corporately, right? Bring it to the group. So if, if we're all one organization today, right? We all started a big property management company. Well, whoever's in charge, Better, better kind of set that vision and inspire us to some aspect of doing things. So one way to do that in a group setting, and if this were 10 years ago, right now we talk about a, a mission statement. All right? Anybody heard about, you know? Anybody come from a company that preached their mission statement? Yeah, and we get it, I get the idea. And, and, and it can work. In our company, what we talk about on a regular basis is our purpose. It's kind of the modern day version of a mission statement, right? Our purpose, because at, at Grace Management, our purpose relates to starting with the why. If, someone, if you're going to inspire someone, you need to tell them why. You need to answer this question for them. Why should I give you my energy? I've got family at home. I've got things going on in my personal life. I've got all this stuff over there. Why should I come to work, of all places, and, and give you passion, give you excitement? And you better have an answer to that. Because if you don't, you will find that you attract employees. We don't like employees, right? We want people that are team members. We want people to buy in. So, for example, when I, we had our Christmas party at um, Grace Management a few, I guess now a few weeks ago, and I, and I said this to them, guys, uh, and this is, our, this is our purpose statement at Grace Management, right? Improving the lives of real estate investors and residents through property management solutions. Now, that could be a throwaway line, couldn't it? Put it up in the back of the break room and refer to it once a year. But, but I said, guys, at our Christmas party, I said, guys, you know, great job this year. I mean, we, we killed it. We did a great job. And I know it's been, it's been a busy, tough year, but I want you guys to know that, we have this on the board, you know, this is what we're doing every day, guys. We can't forget about this. When a tenant pays their rent, and we process that rent, and we give that money to the owner who needs the money to live on, to buy his meds, because he's retired, that's a big deal for that owner. That's a big deal. When the tenant calls in and they don't have hot water, and we get a repairman out there quick, and they fix that hot water, trust me, I got four kids. You wake up with no hot water, that's a bad day. So when we get that stuff fixed quickly, that, that's a life improved that day. When we do something as mundane as a lease renewal, tenants been in a property for a year, they want to stay, we negotiate a new lease, and that lease renewal lets the family stay in that house, and it lets the kid in that house not have to move to a new school and make new friends. Oh, if that doesn't give you a chill, guys, we do that every day. So thank you, thank you on behalf of our tenants who don't say it, and our owners who don't say it. And you guys do that every day. That's the stuff we do every day, isn't it? But is that a little bit more, yeah, I can, I can buy into that, than I do property management. We're landlords, we're slumlords, that's what we do, right? That, that's what you've gotta do. You've gotta explain that to your people, because if you don't, they're not gonna come up with that on their own. They're gonna punch the clock. So you start with that corporate passion, igniting that in people, and by the way, if you're, when I interview somebody, that's the first thing I usually go through is that. And I'm going to get one or two responses. I'm either going to see a smile on their face and be like, yeah, that's pretty cool. Or I'm going to get a, uh-huh, okay, and what are the benefits? Right? And I know right then and there. Okay, thank you for coming. Have a good day. Now, the second way we bring energy is, is individually. Okay, so let's pretend we're the big company for a minute, and let's pretend I'm in charge. So I, I try to inspire us corporately. I'm going to, either I or managers are going to, you know, know the people, right? And I better figure out a way on a one-on-one -on -one basis, especially in a smaller organization, to bring some, some energy, some excitement, some passion on a one-on-one -on -one basis. And here's a couple things that we do in our organization to do that is we're huge on performance rewarding. Financially, number one, yes, everybody has a, has a bonus or commission component. Our accountant has a bonus commission component. You know what it is? Because they're in charge of collections, they get a percentage of late fees collected. So when they collect a late fee, 
think it's 20% of that goes right into their pocket. Does that encourage or discourage my director of accounting to waive late fees? Yes, discourages him. Yeah, some of you were saying, uh, throwing me off here. I know it's early, guys, but stick with me. All right? She doesn't want to waive a late fee because it's money out of her pocket. So we reward performance financially, but we also are big, big, big on public praise within the organization because people need this stuff. Right? And, and the reason that I think I kind of have a platform for this is because I don't like it. I don't, I don't like doing public praise. I want to be the boss who shows up late every day and goes into my office and closes the door and I don't talk to any of my team members. And if they want to thank you, I'll tell you what, I'll give you two thank yous a month in the form of a hand-signed check. Now go to your work, I don't want to see you. Get out of here, go on. But I found out that doesn't work. People don't like those kind of bosses. Shocking, shocking. So we've got to be specific with our team members on praising them when they do well. So one thing we'd started doing about a year and a half ago, we have now our, our home run of the month award. So every month, our team members get together. It's an all team member meeting. And we go through a bunch of things. And then at the very end of the meeting, I say, uh, okay, well, it's time. And, and, and we pull this out, set it on the desk in front of everybody. All right, guys, let's talk about our home run of the month award. And then I will find somebody that did something that month. It may be a, a number they hit, you know, a goal, a financial goal. It may be something they did that really showed who, we, who I want us to be. It can be anything that I want it to be to some extent. And I talk about that person, thank them for what they did. We slide the home run of the month award across the desk and they get to have it sitting on their desk for that month. Okay? I kid you not, like I thought, and you think that's cheesy, Mark? Yeah, it kind of is, but it, it has become not cheesy. I did this, so every month we do this. So two months ago, I slid it across the desk, lady. The woman starts tearing up. She's like, because oh, everybody claps, everybody's like, yeah, oh, good job, good job. And she's like, gosh, guys, thanks, man. Oh, that really means a lot. It's like, oh my gosh, these people are crazy. All right? I mean, <laughs> but, that, but, but we love that. We love that award because we work so hard, don't we? We work so, so hard. And then, then their name goes up on a little plaque and it goes up in the office. What, you know, what does this cost me? <laughs> The silly thing I bought on Amazon for 20 bucks and I have somebody engrave this little thing in there. But we'll talk about it. So Alexis got it in July because what Alexis did is she got a call from a, a client, owner client that wasn't hers. They just got through to her voicemail and they were mad because one of my other PMs missed a meeting, forgot about a meeting with an owner and this owner calls in and upset. So I come into the office Monday morning and listen to my voicemails and the first voicemail says, Mark, this is whoever, whoever, I'm an owner. I am mad. I'm in my property right now. My PM was supposed to be here 20 minutes ago to meet me. I can't get a hold of her. I don't know what kind of company you run. Nah, 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 nah. I'm thinking, oh my gosh, what just happened? Listen to the very next voicemail. Same lady. Hey, different tone of voice. Hey, Mark, this is Susie again. I just want to tell you Alexis is awesome. She came over to my property. She was helping me move some stuff. Whew. Good group of people. Appreciate it. Thanks so much. And I'm like, what in the world happened? I grabbed Alexis. Alexis is like, oh, not my, not my owner client, but she called in my, she somehow got through to my extension. She was mad. Somebody else forgot to go meet her. So I jumped in my car. I went out. I let her enter property. And I was helping her carry her boxes from the basement just to try to appease her, you know, whatever. So do I want to reward that? Do I want to tell my team about that? You bet I do. Now, one of the reasons we do this, it's not just the altruistic, oh, I want to you know, pat you on the back and good job. It's because of this. What is rewarded gets repeated, guys. So when I tell my team that, and I'm like, guys, listen, listen to what Alexis did here. And we don't do this every day, trust me. We're not out meeting owners of their properties carrying boxes out of the basement. But when we screw up, we better fix it. And so we talk about that because I want my team to repeat those things that I like. And so when I constantly praise those things that, that I like at a, on a big level, I know my team's gonna do them again. They're gonna get excited about doing those things again. And it works on that aspect. Something else that uh, we do is, is, is thank yous on a, on a kind of a private level, right? Like, when's the last time you said thank you to one of your team members? Like a heartfelt, hey, thanks for what you do. Has it been a long time? Hopefully not. Your silence is telling me it's been a while. So I, uh, and I'm not a big, again, I'm not a big thank you guy. Not too long ago, I was, it was Friday night, I got home. It's been a long week. It's been a long week for everybody at the office. We just, you know, just one of those crazy weeks. And uh, so I, I was texting something. I thought, you know what, I'm gonna text Holly. Holly's one of our newer property managers and tell her she did a good job this week. She, got, she had a new account. I think it was her first new account that week and she'd been with us for a little while. And, and she's young, she's trying so hard and she's doing a good job, but you know, she just doesn't have a lot of confidence. And so I texted her, this is what I said. Great job, Holly, super proud of you. I get this back from her. Thank you so much, Mark. Your approval means the world to me, really. And, and it does, like if you knew Holly, she's sincere, right? And I thought, oh man, I, sh I should have said that before. 
So now I get this bright idea. Huh, I'm gonna text somebody else. Now I had had about a glass <laughs> and a half of wine at this point, all right? I wouldn't do this stuff without a glass and a half of wine. I mean, on a Friday night, all right? So I texted Daniel. Daniel was pretty new at Grace Management too. And Daniel's killing it. Daniel was my banker. And I stole Daniel away from the bank because he was so impressive. A young guy, and he's just, he's working hard. He's, he's going as fast as he can. I just texted him. I said, love having you at Grace Management, Daniel. Thank you, Mark. I appreciate that. I love working for Grace. Couldn't be happier. And I came back with this, because now I'm in a roll. Right? <laughs> you don't work for Grace Management. You are Grace Management. Nah. Don't forget <laughs> it. That's good. You got to give it up to me on that. That's pretty good, isn't it? <laughs> got it, he says. Right? Right? I was pretty proud of myself. That was after two glasses of wine on that one. I think I'd hit. All right, so, so now we've got our energy, right? We've got our team, whether your team's a team of one, you're, you're inspiring them, you're getting with them, you're praising them, you're doing those things, and we've got that energy, and we've got that room full of second grade girls ready to play basketball. We can't stop there, because energy uncoordinated, untapped, is crazy. We don't want chaos. So how do we bring clarity to the organization? Clarity, I think, starts with you, with us being self-aware of you. Before we try to get clarity set up in our organization, let's get clear, in our, let's look in the mirror. And this isn't as fun. Nobody likes to look in the mirror that way. What, what is your purpose? Whether you're the boss or not, I think our purpose in the organization is probably a little different than most of us think. And this was, this was eye-opening to me when I grasped this concept. Now, when I'm talking to employers, like when I do this for, for um, bosses, this presentation, here's what I say, I say, write this down. My purpose is to make, and I say, take about 30 seconds and just like write in whatever you think your purpose is. Like, what do you think is gonna come next? So people sit there and write down their stuff, and, and I say, hey, this is your purpose, bosses. It's to make your team members successful at their position. That's it. If you come into work every day as a boss with that mindset of my purpose, my purpose, is to make my director of accounting the most successful accounting person in the state of Colorado. Make my leasing person the most successful director of leasing in the state of Colorado. That will revolutionize your business. It'll, it'll make you pour into them. It turns the table so that you don't think they're, they're here to serve me. No, 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 no. That's not, that's not how this thing works. My job is to make them successful. Not happy. My job's not to make them happy. <laughs> My job is not to make them enjoy everything. My job is to make them successful. Because if I could get a group of the most successful people in the state, maybe, in my organization, what would that do to my organization? That would propel us to places we've never been. And, and so this has been our focus. And it, this has worked well for us, guys. This has worked really, really well over the course of time. It doesn't happen overnight. It's not like you flip a switch and all of a sudden it's there. But this, this is a path to be on. So, and if you're not an employer, I still think this is your job. If you're an employee, guess what? You're, if you go into this mindset of your job is to make your boss successful, you will be invaluable to that organization. If you try to make your fellow employees successful at what they do, you will be invaluable. That's how you move up in an organization. Second question to ask yourself is this, how am I perceived by others? Not how do I want to be perceived, not how do I think I am perceived, but how, are, how do others perceive you? If I went into your office and asked, one of your employees, what do, what do you think of that person? Do you know how they would respond? You have to ask yourself that, that hard, hard question. One of my um, team members, this is a while back, she said, uh, well, you, she actually said this as I was firing her. You know, Mark, you're, you're, you're not very approachable. And I'm in the midst of firing her, so whatever. Get out of here. <laughs> Approach out the door, all right? And then about two months later, another one of my team members, like my, a trusted team member, you know, we're having a conversation on this and that, and she goes, you know, yeah, some, sometimes you can be a little bit unapproachable. So now I'm thinking, huh, I, I never realized I was unapproachable. I better, I better be aware of that. I don't even need to necessarily change it, but I better be aware of that fact so that it doesn't negatively impact the organization. You've got to know those things about yourself to know what other people say on your weaknesses are. Second question for bosses especially, and well, everybody, using those words wisely. See guys, if you're the leader, you've got one of these things on all the time. Because when you say something to one of your team members, they don't hear a good job. They hear a, hey, great job. And when you say, oh, you really screwed that up, you really screwed that up, right? You've got a megaphone all the time as the boss. And we forget that we have that megaphone. We've got to remember that and be cautious and careful on our praise and especially on our corrective measures with our people. 
and using your power wisely as the employer as well. So I believe all employers have an invisible sign around their neck that, that other employers can't see. And the sign says, I'm your boss and I could fire you. <laughs> and every time you talk to one of your employees, they're not looking at you, they're looking at the sign on your neck. <laughs> so when they laugh at your jokes, guys, I know a few of you, you're not as funny as you think you are. No, you're not. They're not laughing at your jokes, they're laughing at my jokes. They're laughing at my jokes because I'm the boss. And that's okay, right? It's not a right or wrong, it's just an is. But as employers, if you have somebody that you're responsible for, you just need to acknowledge that, that it's a different relationship there. That, and that's okay, but be cautious, because if you, if you try to pretend it doesn't exist, you're hurting that person, because they know it exists. When you try to be friends with the person that reports to you, don't do that, don't do that. That's not fair to them, because you can fire them, and you may have to, or, you may, or you'll give them a raise, or you won't give them a raise. So don't just be the friend thing, because you do a disservice to the other people in your organization. Second part of clarity that brings clarity to an organization is giving your team members a system to run. We are huge on systems. Systems are really what I feel kind of propelled our business to the next level a number of years ago because it used to be all of us doing it all, right? There were three, four, or five of us and we all did everything. And as we started to grow, we thought this, this can't work. Somehow I need to get out of the business a little bit. A number of years ago, my dad and I were going to a property management conference and my mom was driving us to the airport and we're kind of joking, half joking, half serious. Hey mom, if the plane goes down, like uh, here's my list of passwords on the computer and call this person over there and do this. And we suddenly kind of realized at the same time we looked at each other and thought, huh, you know, if the plane does go down, this company is in trouble because we've got everything up here. My dad had it up there and I had it up here. So we thought that was our backup. But what if something happens to this or what if I just maybe don't want to come in Friday? Like, can the business sustain itself at all? How, what, how are we going to make that happen? Because it's not fair to our team or our owners or our tenants if something happens to us. We didn't even know what that process looked like. So what it looks like today is position-specific system manuals. Every one of our team members has a system manual. That's what allows me to be here today. Because I know my team is back at the office doing the things they need to do. And it also makes it to where we're not team member dependent. We're system dependent. So if a team member quits, moves, you know, we, we had our, our director of accounting a while back, she was awesome, and she said, hey, I've got an opportunity, she was a young single gal, she said, I've got an opportunity to move to Hawaii, and I, and I kind of want to take it. I said, Christina, do it. I mean, are you kidding me? Go to Hawaii. Now, that hurts to lose Christina, because she was awesome, but it doesn't matter to some extent, because the system ran it, so we can plug somebody else in to that position. But as, if you grow, as you grow, you've got to have systems in place system manuals in place to get that done. And systems do this. They really explain what to do, they explain how to do it, and they define what winning looks like for the organization. So you've got to put those things in place, whatever that looks like for your company. Now, so we've got our energy, we've got our clarity. Now the third thing we need to bring to our organization is some accountability. Now remember, we're defining accountability as simply measuring and reporting on performance. We've got to know, not just know our numbers, I don't mean that, I mean but know how our people are doing and give them feedback on how they're doing, help them get better. Because remember our job is to what? Somebody remember, please make me feel like I'm valuable. Successful. Thank you, make them successful at their position, right. So one way to, to do that is to create, what we call them measures of success for every task a person does. So this kind of ties into the system manual, right? If somebody has a system manual and it says, hey, here's your eight, nine, 10 things to do. These are the main things you are responsible for. And people need to know this. Everybody should have this. Think of, a, think of this as like a job description on steroids, okay? This is what you do, this is how you do it. And we're gonna tie a very specific measure of success to that thing you do. So for example, our, one of our property, our property managers have eight KRAs, we call them our key result areas, the main things. It's like tenant relations, owner relations, <laughs> security deposit returns, bring on new accounts, handle maintenance. For every one of those things, there's a, a measurable measure of success. So for uh, maintenance requests, it is have all maintenance requests off to the vendor within 24 hours of receipt. Is that specific? Let me ask you, is that specific? Is that measurable? Can I measure that? And is it timely? Like, is there a timeline on it? Yeah, so I can know, and they can know if they're doing a good job with that or not. I tell our new hires, guys, guys, you will never have to wonder if you're doing a good job or not. You'll never have to wonder, gosh, does the boss think I'm doing well or not? Why? Because it's all laid out right here. You know if you're doing a good job before I do it. As a matter of fact, you're gonna report to me 
on how you're doing based upon your measures of success. Because this is going to tell you what winning looks like. And, and team members like that. They want to know how they're doing. So for our director of leasing, uh, a couple of her KRAs are you know, uh, return phone calls or, or phone calls from uh, prospects, emails from prospects, schedule showings. So around the return phone calls from prospects, I think it's uh, ha have return phone calls of any inquiry within 12 business receipt. So again, it's specific, it's measurable, and it's timely. And, and it's, it's either like you did it or you didn't. It's not a, well, it doesn't say quickly. We don't use the word quickly. Never use the word quickly. We have a new team member the other day, and, and I said, hey, how's that, that project coming? She goes, oh, it'll be done pretty soon. I said, ah, Kristen, Kristen. I said, you know me, Kristen. I hate the word soon, because soon to you might mean next Tuesday, and soon in my mind may mean in five minutes. So let's not use the word soon. And she's like, yeah, got it. Kristen's great. It, but she got it, right? Because we don't want to say soon. That's not, that's not how we measure success. Soon? So you've got to be very, very specific in telling your team members and yourself what winning looks like for the organization. The second way I found that is very, very useful in improving accountability is one-on-one -on -one meetings. Guys, if you're not doing this, if you come away with one thing today, please make it this. Start having one-on-one, -on -one, and I'll tell you what they look like here in just a minute, monthly meetings with the team members in your office, with the people that report to you. If you're in a huge organization, then this should be like a spider web down where you've got the people under you, the bosses under you reporting, and they've got the people under them reporting up. And if you've got a team of, of six people and you're the boss, quote unquote, every one of those should have a one-on-one -on -one meeting with you. This is so valuable. We do this every Wednesday. I do this with all the property managers. So I'm, I'm the president of our organization. And somebody asked me earlier, so, so Mark, what exactly is it that you do? Well, I don't quite know, but I get paid a lot of money to do it, so don't ask. <laughs> but what I do, so I'm the president of the organization, but one of my tasks is all the PMs report directly to me. I'm the boss for the property managers. And every Wednesday, full day Wednesday, nothing is on my schedule except one-on-one -on -one meetings with my PMs. And each of them are 20 minutes. And it's like, it's a 30 minute window. So at 12 o'clock noon, I've got someone coming in, it's a 20 minute meeting, I've got 10 minutes to prep for the next one, the next PM. It's all day Wednesday, guys. Like it is all day Wednesday. It was, which was, so this week, on Wednesday this week, I was doing this all day. My last PM came into my office and she goes, I just realized something, Mark. You do this all day Wednesday, don't you? I said, yeah. She goes, because I, you know, I came in early this morning, I saw your car was in the lot, I went to lunch, I saw was, your car was in the lot, I came back, she goes, do you even eat on Wednesdays? <laughs> I, I opened my drawer and I pulled out a little power bar. I was like, this is my 15 minute power snack between meetings. And she goes, wow, that, that's a busy day for you. And, and it is a busy day for me. It takes me all day. It is my all day Wednesday, but this is what I said to her. I said, yeah, it's a busy day for me, but you know what? I said, I think this is the most valuable day of the week for me because it gives me an opportunity to, ha number one, have my finger on the pulse, know what's going on, and to have a one-on-one -on -one with every one of my PMs. And I'll tell you in a moment kind of what we talk about from an agenda standpoint, but to, get, to gauge what's going on, to give my feedback, to see how they're doing, one-on-one -on -one meetings with your team members will change your culture probably like nothing else because I guarantee if you have somebody that reports to you in any shape, form, or fashion, the communication between you and them in their mind is not as good as it is in your mind. That's just the nature of being the boss. You think you communicate effectively. You probably don't, at least not as well as you think you do. You think they, they can read your mind. No, they can't. This is a way for them to do that. So here's, here's a couple purposes of the one-on-one -on -one meeting. Number one, Part of this is to build that relationship, guys, to build that trusting relationship. If they don't trust you as a boss, things are not gonna go well. Things are just absolutely not gonna go well. So the, one of the purposes of having weekly, and it is weekly, one-on-one -on -one meetings is, is to establish that relationship of trust that they know they can come to you with their issues. Number two is to improve the system. It's not just about them. This is not a touchy-feely meeting. The basis of this meeting is our system manual. So we're gonna spend some time going through the system manual to number one, ensure they're doing it the way the system manual says. Number two, is the system manual correct? And number three, how can we do it better? This is the opportunity for us to have a conversation for them to say something like, Mark, you know, I know as we're going through this particular KRA on leasing, it says to do this, 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 and this, but I think I found a more efficient way to do it. What if we did this, 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 and this? And I'll either say, yeah, that's awesome. Let's, let's update it, let's change it. We just made an improvement. Or I'll say, oh yeah, I, I get what you're saying, that's a great idea, however, you know, what you don't realize is that impacts this over here, so that's kind of why we can't maybe make that change, but, but great thinking. 
love the way you're thinking, keep doing it, keep bringing those things to me. It's a system-based meeting because we're talking about improving the business in this meeting as well. And the third purpose is to give candid feedback. People want feedback, guys. Now, I would caution you if you're gonna start doing these things, hold off on the negative feedback for a few weeks, okay? We're all good at giving our corrective feedback. But for, I'm, I'm, uh, I was talking to a guy the other day and he's starting to do this with this company. And he's like, okay, Mark, this, here's my, he's telling me his agenda. This is my agenda for my first one-on-one. -on -one. He's a little nervous. I got my first one-on-one -on -one meeting coming up and I'm gonna talk about this. And, and I, got, I have my list of feedback items for the person. He's like, all right, well, what's your list? Well, I'm gonna tell them they're, they're not, I don't like their tone of voice on the phone. I'm gonna tell them that they're coming in a little bit late. I don't like the way they're dressing. They need to be a little more professional. Like this guy's all in at this point. I was like, whoa, 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 okay, hold on, hold on, hold on. You've never done a one-on-one -on -one before, right? Nope, first one. Okay, let's go back to item number one, okay? <laughs> Build a trusting relationship. If you suddenly come in, they're not gonna see this as a meeting, as a way to improve the system. They're gonna see this as a meeting in a way for you to beat them up, okay? So for the next two months on your one-on-ones, I don't want you to give them any negative feedback at all. He goes, no, what, no negative feedback? I was like, no because they're not gonna trust you otherwise. It's just a, a meeting to beat them up. For every negative you're gonna give them, at least give them three positives, but nothing for, for two months. You gotta find good things they're doing for two months. Because this is a good person that, that they're talking about there. He, does, he doesn't wanna fire this person, he likes them. But when you get that to that place that you can give candid feedback, and candid is the key word, if you're taking notes, write down the word candid, because that needs to be something you build into your organization. An organization that is not candid will not succeed. I recently read uh, the book, uh, Jack Welsh, the, old, the um, CEO of GE, right? Uh, what's it called? I think it's just called Winning, great book. And he talks about how to run a successful organization. Chapter one, most important foundational thing Jack Welsh says, to have a good organization, be candid. I never saw that one coming. Really? Be candid? Because he says this, he says, you know what? If you're not candid, nothing else matters. Everything else is like a lie. Nobody believes anything. You have to be candid with your people. Now, candid means you have to have trust first. Otherwise, you're just mean. Right? <coughs> but if your team members trust that they know that your job is to make them successful, then you can be candid. Because they know you're not coming at them from a place of negativity or I, want, I don't like you. No, I want you to be the best you can be. So this is one of our, like, our core foundational rock values of our companies. We say we are candid and we, we define being candid as this. Speaking the truth with grace even when there's risk. I like that. Speaking the truth with grace even when there's risk. And I bring this up even on interviews. So as we're, we're I'm sitting down to interview somebody and I'll say, you know, one of the things we are as an organization is candid. So if you come on board here, you can expect the organization to be candid with you, and we expect you to be candid with us. And, and I tell the story, I said, so here's an example of how candid I am as a boss. And I've already laid the foundation of, look, my job is to make you successful, right? I mean, that's what I am here to do to make you successful. I say, uh, you know, we had a gal that was working for us a couple years ago, um, part-time in the summer, she was a young high school girl, and she was, she was awesome. I mean, she's gonna be uber successful. She's our front desk person. And one of the things we are is professional. That's like one of our mantras, we're professional. So we don't do this every day, it's not suit and tie, but it's, it's, it's sharp. We're sharp looking, right? That's, that's part of who we are culturally. And, uh, and this girl was doing great. And one day though, I, uh, I called her in my office and said, I don't remember what her name was, Christina, you know, you're doing great, love you, you're killing it, you're gonna be uber successful, I want you here long term forever. But there's one thing I need you to tweak from the professionalism standpoint. She goes, oh, what is it? I said, you can't wear such low cut tops. Now, now I would not say it's today. I wouldn't, all right? This was like 10 years ago. We're in a different <laughs> world today. I'd get sued. I know I would, I know I would. I said, you know, you're up at the front desk. I mean, professionalism is huge, right? And you want to give the best image you can give. And it was a weird conversation, I'll admit. And I, and I really wouldn't, I would not do that today. I'd have my director of operations, who's a, who's a woman. I'd have her do it. I tell, so I tell the story today, people, they're like, are you, I, I'm, I'm even hesitant to tell the story now because I'm like, oh, I'm pretty sure you, they can retroactively sue you, Mark, for, for something. I was like, but and she knew where I was coming from. Like, it wasn't, it was a little bit weird, I get it. But I want her to be the best, right? So that's, that's the level of candidness you can expect in this organization, right? And if, they, if they're like, oh, that offends me, I just know what I need to know about you now. Bye bye. Thank you for coming. Right? But we're going to have that open dialogue and we're going we're to address things that need to be addressed, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Why? Because the organization needs to win in every form and fashion. So part of this feedback, and again, it's, it's got to be more praise than it is beating people up, but that's going to be part of the meeting. So it's one time per month, 
Dude, every single month, at least every single month. Now, we've gone to weekly now, and I, I think weekly is the way to go. But if you're going to just start off, at least go once month to month. Now, up until six months ago, a year ago, I, I had two titles in our company. I was the president and director of operations. And, and I, I couldn't do both of them real well, just from a busyness standpoint. So I kind of fired myself from the director of operations role, brought in a new director of operations, and she's awesome. She's better than I ever was at it. So she has everybody in the organization reporting to her other than the PMs. The PMs report to me, everybody else reports to her. So she is now, just last week, she told me, Mark, I want to start doing these meetings with all the other team members, which had been one time per month. She said, I want to do them weekly because I see now the value in the regular FaceTime on these things. And a couple things that these things will do for you if, you're the, if you have people reporting to you, it actually reduces. And it should. And it should what? That? Testing one, two, three. <laughs> okay, and it should. <laughs> wow, I must be in the South. All right. <laughs> That could have been really bad, couldn't it? <laughs> oh, goodness. Okay. Oh, talk about losing your train of thought. One time. Testing, one, two, three. Testing. That must be the next room. Testing, I'm, I'm one, guessing. two, three. It's, uh, I've never made the mistake yet of not taking this off before I go to the restroom. All right? I, I'm waiting for that time to happen. People are always like, hey, don't forget to turn it off. It's like the running joke in the speaker world, right? Hey, did you ever forget to turn it off when you go to the thing? All right, calendar. Put it on the calendar so it's a reoccurring event. You want it to be every single month reoccurring. Because if you just say to your team members, hey, I'd like to start sitting down with you once a month and, or once every week and kind of have this check meeting, here's what we're going to do. If you don't calendar it, they don't think it's important to you. See, if ours is every single Wednesday, every single month, or excuse me, every single week, every Wednesday at 1030. Now, do I do it every time? Of course not. Sometimes it has to get moved. But now I have something to move on the calendar. Because if it turns into a, hey, when, I have to, when we both have some time, let's sit down and go some, through some things, what is your direct going to say, first of all? Okay, boss, whatever you say. And then you're going to go to them and say, hey, uh, how about about 15 minutes from now? I'm, I'm free. Okay, sure. <coughs> They've had no time to prepare for it, and they see, it's not valuable to, to them in your eyes, right? But if it's on the calendar and it's reoccurring, that means something different to them. So we calendar these things. They're 30 to 60 minutes in length. Ours are down to 30 at this point in time. Right? But it's going to be 30 minutes, typically now with my PMs, it's actually like a 20 minute meeting. And our agenda, the first 10 minutes is their time. So what that means is I'm going to go whatever direction they want to go in. Because part of this is about building that relationship. Right? Without a relationship, guys, you don't know your people. You just don't know them. And you need to know your people. That's part of the energy side of things. That's part of the inspiration, inspiring them, is know your people. Know what makes them tick. So I start our meetings off. I'm going to jump ahead here with this, with this question. And I've tweaked this and played with this over the years. And, I, it, and this is it. Like, this is, this is the way it needs to be. Asking this question. So tell me about your week. I don't say, how's your week going? Because if I say to you, how's your week going, what do you say to me? Fine. Good. OK, well, let's shut down that conversation. But if I say to you, so tell me about your week. Now I've just kind of opened the door for you to go wherever you want to go. So my team members are going to go into, they might go into their personal life. I, they might go into the crazy, difficult situation they're dealing with. You know, one of my team members is like, oh, have I having a rough week? That's what she said. My dog bit my cat's face off yesterday. <laughs> now, I, what I wanted to say is, well, you know what? Your cat probably had it coming, all right? Because I don't like cats. I didn't say that. I held back. And I was like, oh, really? Ugh, that sounds awful. And she was like, yeah. And she's a cat person. She like, starts tearing up. She's like, oh, it's terrible. I'd take her to the vet. And, uh, oh, that sounds terrible. That's not, what, that's not me. That's not what I do. But I, but I care about my people, right? If it matters to her, it matters to me. So I'm talking about Fluffy, the cat, for 10 minutes. Okay? And, I, and I'm bad at this. I am like a type A, hard driving, let's get the work done, let's get the stuff done. I mean, that's not what I want to do, but I know it, it matters. So for example, on my, I have a sheet of paper, I've got a notebook for each one of these, and every day I flip the, or every week I pick, flip the page, and I take notes on our meetings. So before they come in, I'm reviewing my notes from the last week's meeting. And I have to do that, because I'll forget stuff. And I, and I know I forget stuff. So I've got to write big things down that you wouldn't think people would forget. Like one of our team members, Jessica, got married last summer. And I had to write, make sure I wrote down, ask Jessica about the wedding. Right? Because she's all excited. She's getting married. She's going to, going to uh, Mexico to get married. That's great. She's going to Mexico to get married. And so she took a week off and she came back. And so we're getting ready for a meeting. And so I'm reviewing it. I was like, oh, good night. Thank you. I reviewed the notes. Ask about the wedding. 
So she comes in all tan and excited. And I said, Jessica, wedding last week. I know, I know you did it. How was it? How was the wedding? <laughs> She's like, oh, it was great. It was Mexico. We did that. And then she pulled out her big old picture album, flumps it on the desk. <laughs> she goes, you want to see some pictures? It's like, yeah. <laughs> Let's see. So she's like, Clint, here we are at the airport. Here we are getting on the plane. You know, like, oh, that's great. You know? So the idea is, it's because it's not about me, right? It's not about me. That's important to her. So we're going to make the time to do it. Because some of us think, well, that's not like, they need to conform to me. I'm the boss. Ugh, guys, you won't be the boss very long. You won't have people that want to follow you, right? You've got to do this stuff because this is what people need. You go back one time here. So, and then, then I end them. So then we go through the system manual, a portion of the system manual during this one-on-one -on -one meeting. And then I spend the end of the meeting giving whatever little typical feedback things I want to give. And our, and our people know that we give constant feedback. So they give feedback to me as well. If they have an issue with something, they don't like something, they have a question on a process, a system, they, they have free reign to come into my office and say that. Although I have been told I'm unapproachable. So maybe they don't. But I'm going to give that feedback then at that meeting as well. And, and feedback, guys, by the way, it needs to be constant. It needs to be regular. Don't, if you're doing an annual um, review, stop. Start doing these things instead. These things make an annual review a piece of cake. Because the annual re review typically sounds like, hey, you know exactly how you're doing because we talk about it every week. Love what you're doing. Appreciate what you're doing. Is it okay if I pay a little bit more money? And I'm, I'm not kidding. That's what our annual, our annual reviews sound like. Because they know how they're doing. It's, it's easy, we have constant feedback. For those of you that are saving your feedback, quote unquote, to your annual review, you really want a person repeating that behavior for 12 months or six months and then you're gonna to talk to them about it? That is a terrible way to lead. I, I mentioned I coach my, my kids' basketball team. One of my, my boys is uh, fourth grade and uh, they play basketball and so I'm the coach. And so one of the drills we did at the beginning of the season is we line up for layups, right? Okay, boys, you line up on this side, you boys line up on this side, you guys are gonna come in, you're gonna shoot a layup, you guys are gonna get the rebound, pass it back to them. So I stand there at the baseline, and every kid that comes through, I'm critiquing their layup, right? The first kid comes through, and he shoots, and I go, hey, good shot, but you jumped off the wrong foot. Jump off your left foot next time. Okay, gotcha. Oh, good shot, but you gotta go higher off the backboard. See the square up there? You gotta aim high off that square. Okay, yeah, okay. Good shot, but you're jumping way too late. You gotta jump much, much earlier. I'm critiquing every shot. That's what we need to do with our people. You critique everything after you've established the trust, right? Don't just start critiquing, you've established the trust and your coach, that's what a coach does, that's what a leader does. So when you see that email come across your desk that, that needs to be tweaked, let the team member know in a, in a caring, positive way that they need to tweak that. But you've got to give constant feedback because that's what makes them better and they want to get better and it's what makes the organization better. So energy, clarity, accountability. I truly believe that's, that's leadership. That's it right there. Like, leadership is the most over-talked, over-analyzed thing there is. But if you can bring these three things, and it's gotta be top of mind. Like, I, some days I walk in my office, if you're walking in your office and you're tired, like Monday morning and you're kind of dragging, ugh, and you walk in, like I've gotta kind of flip that switch in my head. Because I know if I don't, it negatively impacts my team, my group, it absolutely does. On more than one occasion, I've had, this just happened a month ago, my director of operations in my office, we're meeting over some stuff, and she goes, hey, is, um, is everything okay? I said, yeah, why, why, is there something not okay? She's like, no, no, I don't know. She goes, just, you, this is what she said, just seems like you've been kind of blah lately. Blah, blah? I was like, really? She goes, yeah, yeah, I don't know, just wanna make sure everything is okay. I said, guys, their radar's up, isn't it? When, when you as a leader, if there's something that you're not, focusing on or giving your energy to, people pick that up and they don't like it, it scares them. <coughs> because our job as the leader is to bring that and if you're not bringing it, it freaks people out. People don't like that, you've got to bring that. So sometimes when you walk in that office Monday morning and you're feeling tired, leave it in your car. Leave the tiredness in your car. Bring that energy, bring that passion, bring that excitement, bring that clarity of everything that goes on in your office and you bring that accountability. And what you're trying to do is get to the place where those things come together. If you're only an office of energy, ugh, God help you, it will be awful, right? It'll be terrible. If you've only got accountability, that means you're a micromanager. If you've only got clarity, it just probably means you're an accountant, 
<laughs> right? You've got to have the confluence of these three things and where they come together in your organization. Again, whether it's you or you and one other person or you and your spouse or you and your, your uh, nonprofit group, you've got to bring these three things to that group. And that's what will make the difference. So here's what I want you to do. You have pencil and paper? We've got a few minutes left. Write down energy, clarity, accountability on your paper. You gotta bring pencils and papers, guys. Come on, you're at a conference here. And what I want you to do next to each one of those words, I want you to make a little smiley face or a little sad face or a little, what do we call the middle one? Even face. Based upon how your company does, how you grade yourself on bringing these things. Take 30 seconds and do that. Don't worry, I won't ask you to share. Do you think you're doing a good job? Do you need to improve on it? And remember, these things are not, it's not a destination. You don't arrive. You never achieve them. It's a constant struggle. It's a constant path you're on. You're always trying to get better at it. You're always trying to improve at it. So if you're a one right now, if you kind of get like on a one to 10 scale, if you're like, oh, Mark, we're so terrible. That's okay. Going from a one to a two, guys, that's a 100% increase. <laughs> Let's be positive, right? So that makes a big deal. Start on that path, start on that journey, because I promise you, you don't know where this stuff can take you. If you just start engaging in this, even if it feels fake, and by the way, it will, it will feel fake. All right, it'll feel totally fake. If you're like me, it totally feels fake at times. But the more you engage in it, the more real it becomes and the more you see the impact of those things going on out there, a lot of what we do feels fake. When I, we give this, uh, this talk on a bigger scale sometimes, like a full day thing, and one of the things we talk about is the, uh, um, the perception of uh, being inauthentic with this stuff, right? Because people are like, Mark, that's, that, that's fine. Maybe that's you, but that's not me. That, that would be fake for me. That would be inauthentic. I say, okay, let's talk about that for a little bit. Do you ever feel inauthentic when you work out? I feel inauthentic the first half mile of every time I run. I'm just faking it. I'm going through the motions. I don't care. It's not about authenticity, guys. It's about doing what needs to be done to get the results you need to achieve. This will get you the results you need, and this will improve the way you're doing leadership.